Uncle John was my friend and my brother in Christ, as he was to many of you. Uncle John was born on the 8th of March, 1931, and he fell asleep in Christ on the 27th of September, 2021. He was baptised into Christ in the Adelaide Ecclesia in June, 1953, and he was a founding member of the Enfield Ecclesia that was established in 1957. And he remained a member of that ecclesia with his wife, Verna, until he fell asleep last week. John married the love of his life, Verna, on the 2nd of July, 1955, and they had seven children, five girls and two boys. And then he had 20 grandchildren and 37 great-grandchildren. Yes, 37 great-grandchildren. His was a full life, a life that was prioritised by his faith and his family. And many of us at Blackburn and Bird were the beneficiaries of his life of faith. He loved the word of God, as we do. And he was blessed with a rare gift of being able to bring that word to life especially his character studies. Speaking with his children just recently, they speak of an amazing father, an amazing dad, a dad full of love and fun, full of adventure, but never at the expense of his faith and his love of God. And some of us were blessed to feel and see the fun side of Uncle John, to see the passion of Uncle John, to see the emotional side of Uncle John. But all of us who heard him, we experienced his love and his passion for the word of God. Uncle John was not perfect. Uncle John was a flawed human being. And he was more than honest about those failings, about those flaws. And we didn't have to always agree with Uncle John about everything. Yes. He was passionate. Yes, he was loud and outspoken. And yes, he was, he was strongly opinionated, had strong views and opinions about various and many issues. But what was more important to Uncle John than winning any argument was this, that we read the word of God, that we allowed the word of God to direct us in our thoughts, in our thinking. And, and really he, he really just wanted us to read God's word, to love God's word the way he loved it. And that is where most of us at Blackburn and, and those of our number that, that grew up with him, even around Adelaide, or those of us who grew up overseas and, and heard him by, by, by videos and by tapes. And so this video recording is, is a record of some of the, some of the messages that, and the memories that, that some of our members have considered and thought about when they think about Uncle John, when they think about the times and places when they met him or when they heard him and some of the thoughts that come to mind when we say Uncle John. The video also has some aspects of, of some, some comments and, and thoughts that Uncle John expressed to me in a couple of interviews I did with him six or seven years ago, together with some, some clips of, of, of other aspects. For, for me personally, I first recall Uncle John being in our house, being in my mum and dad's house in Will Street, Q. What, uh, what used to happen in the very early 60s, well, first of all, in, in 1960, my, my mum and dad bought a very large house in Q. They renovated that house, they extended that house, became a very large house with, with very large rooms and, and they could hold up to 100 people in, in, in their living and family rooms. And Uncle John would, would come across from Adelaide and speak at those Bible classes. He packed the house out. And we also had a, a triple garage that, that Dad had built for, for the various cars that were starting to accumulate around the house. And, and we would pack that out as well if we needed to. And so Uncle John became a familiar personality and a familiar character around my house in Kew. My, my dad had, was very generous when it came to, to supporting the, the, the work of the truth and, and he used to fund various aspects of, of, of brothers and sisters that would come to Australia for various aspects 
of the work of God. And especially if, if Brother Harry, uh, Harry Tennant or Brother Bob Lo Lloyd would come, Dad would simply say to the committees, look, I'm happy to help fund all of this stuff on the one condition that when Harry or Bob come to town, they get to stay with me. Everybody else can stay anywhere else, but Bob and Harry get to stay with me. And there was only one interstate brother that Dad was ever really interested in having stay at his home, and that was Uncle John. And so the same criteria applied. If Uncle John came to Melbourne and it was under, under anything that Dad was involved with, then Uncle John stayed with us in our house. And so I grew up with Uncle John in the living room, in the family room, at the dinner room, in the dining table, and, 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 and all the various aspects that Uncle John and the stories that he would tell us. And we would laugh and laugh our heads off until the time of the Bible class, and then things would get quite serious again. So, so Uncle John has been a, an integral part of my life in many aspects as I've grown up, first of all, be, before I was uh, baptised, then after I was baptised, and then, of course, after I came to join the Bird of Blackbird Ecclesia. And the Bird of Blackbird Ecclesia was, was formed in 1970 as the Bird Ecclesia in those days. And until 1989, the, the Ecclesia had rented three different halls, one in Burwood, then they'd moved to Box Hill, and then they'd, we, we, we'd all moved across to uh, North Ringwood. And, and that was the, the hall that we had until we moved into this current hall that we have, which is in Blackburn South, and we moved there in 1989. But it was while we, the, the Burwood Ecclesia was renting its first hall in Turak Road, Burwood, that the Burwood Ecclesia held its first June study weekend. And that was in 1974 at the Sindel Community Centre. And the first speaker was Uncle John. And he gave that remarkable study that, that he's so renowned for, so familiar for, called Samson. What an amazing study it was. And Uncle John continued to lead the Burwood June weekends for seven consecutive years before Helen Stretton's dad came and did a study for us because Uncle John was unavailable. And he broke that, that streak of seven consecutive June weekends. But Uncle John would in fact go on to lead the June weekend for 14 of the first 18 June weekends. And on 16 of those occasions, brothers and sisters of, of, of the Blackburn Burwood Ecclesia would take John into their home and put him and Vernon up and they would bring people home, small groups of brothers and sisters to, to have fellowship and to share a meal or to share afternoon tea or, 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 or supper with, with Uncle John and Auntie Verna. And of course, those, those times were legendary because that's when you really got up close and personal with Uncle John. And that's where many of us created and forged these amazing relationships and friendship and love with Uncle John and of course, Auntie Verna, who was such an integral part of his life. Now, we're not here to eulogise uh, Uncle John. We're not here to do that. We're not here to eulogise him uh, above you know, any others that have fallen asleep before him. But to simply remember our Uncle John as a friend and brother in Christ, who has fallen asleep, but a brother who has helped and encouraged so many of us here at Blackburn today. And it's a time and an opportunity for us to reflect and be thankful for his friendship for his words of encouragement, for his studies, for his great love and passion for the word of God. So we have a number of interviews with, with, with brothers and sisters of the Ecclesia that we're going to look at now as we, we travel through this uh, period of time. And I invite you to uh, stay online at the end so that we might enjoy each other's company uh, after this video is completed. So from here, we're going to introduce some of the other brothers and sisters have some thoughts and amazing memories of Uncle John. When Brother Charlie Taylor called me, I nearly didn't answer because I thought, what does this brother want now? But when he asked me if I would like to give my thoughts on uh, Brother John Martin, I thought, well, yes, I would love to do that. But also, how am I going to fit it into two minutes? When I was a young lad, I used to love going to Glenlock. Mum told me as we were talking about Uncle John the other day that it was I who influenced them in going to Glenlock because of my desire to hear him and they were all for it. 
And often after the talks at Glenlock, some of them which went for over an hour, and I was absolutely enthralled with everything he was saying, I had questions that I wanted to ask him. And I would go up to him but couldn't get through because of the, the crush of brethren around him, all trying to give Uncle John their little bit of wisdom. Now, about 15 years ago, um, I was invited with Joe to Steve and Jen Mansfield to have a, a meal with Uncle John and Auntie Verna, and I was just thrilled. Um, and at that meal, I actually mentioned this to Uncle John, and he, with some sadness, um, said to me that uh, he understood that this happened, but he was sort of stuck where he had to actually talk to these brethren, but he would have loved to have talked to the younger people. And what I noticed with having uh, a meal and, and being uh, in an intimate setting with him, that Uncle John was actually quite a touchy-feely person because he's, as he's talking to me, and I was sitting next to him, he would lean over and touch shoulders. Now, I wouldn't have known that of him if it wasn't for that meal, so I'm very grateful for it. But I know I'll see Uncle John again. I know we'll have other discussions, and I'd like to thank him then for... He was the brother that showed me that the word was more than just black writing on white paper, but there was so much more if you delved into the scriptures. So for that, I'm eternally grateful. If there was only, apart from the Bible, if there was one book that you would recommend for studying or preparing studies, things like that, outside of the bottle, what book would you go to? I'd have no hesitation in answering that because it, there, there, there is a set of books in our library which will, will, won't, probably won't exhaust every subject but it'll, it'll give you a start on almost every subject in the Bible and that's person's story of the Bible. It, it is number one in my library. Mm. Not because I worship Percy Mansfield, he was my father in the truth, it's got nothing to do with that. But when I had these boys at School of the Prophets, Uncle John, I, I can't find anything on this subject. I said, have you read the story of the Bible? Then you won't. First, because it's the story of the Bible, told in a childlike way, it's not going to be exhaustive in every subject. But I don't hardly know a subject in that that's not, you can't get a start in the story of the Bible. Mm -hmm. So when, you, and, and the, the Charlie, I say this too, that as a warning to all the young people, young fellas especially, you know, this attitude that, I'm going to do the study for myself first, and then I'll have a look at these things. And I say that, well, you're an idiot. <laughs> I tell them that, you are an idiot. Because I can see a lot further when I stand on someone else's shoulders. And, and I said, if you went to get, get a driver's license, you wouldn't say to the tutor, stand aside, but I'll show you, I'll give it a go first, then you tell me afterwards. You'd probably finish up in hospital. I said, I drag down every one thing written in the pioneers about any subject I'm doing, and the story of the Bible is number one. And I'll read them all. I get all their ideas, now I'm standing on their shoulders, I see a lot further. But that, that would be my first choice, yeah. I'm pretty young, so when Uncle John was in his prime, coming to Blackburn every single year, doing his June weekend studies, I was only a little kid, and I don't remember any of the studies or any of the topics that were on. My memories of him coming to Melbourne and coming to our meeting was this funny looking bald man with some spots on his forehead. He was really s sweaty. He had heaps of saliva in his mouth and he used to spit a lot when he did talks. And there was just a lot of rumors around that he was awesome at football. And they were my memories of him when he was coming doing those wonderful studies at Blackburn. But my best memories of Uncle John came years later. When I was about 15 years old, Dad told me that I should listen to his Elijah studies that he did at Glenlock. So one night at about 10 p.m., I turned off all the lights in the house, I laid down on the couch, I put my earphones in and clicked play on Uncle John's first talk on Elijah at Glenlock. Now, 10 p.m. at night with all the lights off um, is a pretty dangerous situation if you're trying to listen to a talk. But for the next four hours, I listened to three talks in a row and not once did I feel like falling asleep because Uncle John brought the character Elijah to life. I'd read the words of the stories of Elijah of Elijah on the, in the Bible so many times and the words came to life. I saw Elijah's strengths. I saw his weaknesses. 
actually felt like I was there at Mount Carmel and I could picture the scene and it was exactly the same at Mount Sinai. I felt like I was there and hearing the still small voice just like Elijah did. And that's what Uncle John did for me and Elijah's been my favourite Bible character ever since I listened to those talks that he did. Since then, I listened to his talks on Joseph and the life of Christ, and he did exactly the same thing with Joseph and our Lord Jesus. He brought them to life for me, and that's had a massive impact on my life. So I can't wait to be in the kingdom and to see Uncle John and thank him so much for those wonderful words that he gave me. As a young boy and as a teenager, what were your aspirations as far as your career and your work go? Did you have any... Like when you were at school, surely you were thinking, oh, I'm going to be a carpenter or I'm going to be a banker. No. No, sport crazy. Just sport crazy, yeah. So what was your first job after you left school then? Working in a cotton mill, uh, learning to be a loom tuner. <laughs> a loom tuner? Yeah, you know, the looms. And, and oh, the, yes. And yep. the cotton mills, they used to have these big, long rows of looms, and you, you had to, actually, it would be illegal today. Yeah, because you just yeah. when you got into work, once the you know the bell sounded for, for go, everybody turned the loom on. You, you, you'd have to be a lip reader. Yeah, yeah. I couldn't read. Li I couldn't lip read. But they, the the girls used to talk to each other. They'd have about six looms to look after a girl, and they'd be across different roads. They would talk to each other, maybe in a distance of twenty or thirty meters, just by the lips talking, because you couldn't hear. You wouldn't be able to hear anything. What year was this? Be raw. What year is this? Roughly. Oh, heck, that'd be going back in the early, late 40s, I suppose, right, okay. early 50s. And how long did you last in that first job? Not very long. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm not absolutely sure, but right. that was the first okay. job I ever had. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. All right, so what would be, if you're able to, what would be your favourite study? Oh, oh you ask anybody in right. Infield. Life of Christ? Absolutely. Yeah. And I was going to say your favourite character, but let's put the life of Christ and Jesus aside. He's exception. Maybe. Exception. So now what's your favourite study or your favourite Bible, and, and your favourite Bible character? I would say my favourite character study would have been John the Baptist. Right. Yeah, because that followed Elijah too. And yep. that, that Elijah was my first Glenlock in 69. Yeah. 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 It's interesting when you, you talk to people because... You know, you, 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 I use the word legendary in the sense that people talk about the studies. and, I and say, that was pretty high on my list. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah. And, and, and people remember them well, and, and and people talk about them because they lived in the moment with you yeah. during those studies. It's almost like they, yeah. they become a part of the, of the storyline. I think it's fair to say that I was hearing this voice while I was still in the womb. Uncle John was always in the background. It was around a smoky campfire at Glenlock or end of your studies or later School of the Prophets in Adelaide and Melbourne. That's when it really came to the foreground more. Um, as a young man working out where I was going to go in life, I remember particularly a School of Prophets at Hebron um, and Uncle John was speaking on Hosea and he broke my heart with the story of Hosea and Goma and taught, taught us all that God loves us because of who he is and not because of what we've done. Went out that night under a pine tree and in hours of prayer on my knees gave my life to God. I think there's probably a lot of stories like that. God has used Uncle John well. Um, his love for God, his love for the Bible, the passion he has for it, it's contagious and it's instructive. Remember once I moved to Melbourne I worked in a window factory for almost a few years and every day I'd plug in my old or oh, early mp3 player and for probably about six hours straight would listen to um, Uncle John, Life of Christ or on the Prophets or something to the point where I used to write all these notes up on my on my workbench as well. That's how Jackson sort of came to know God. But um, I would go home sometimes and I'd actually think in John Martin's voice. <laughs> I'd had so much of it that day. Um, the sacrifice that he made 
um, and only Verna made, their whole family, uh, to teach us how to get into the wilderness and to hear God. Um, it's invaluable. And I look forward to seeing him again soon, seeing him with his guard down like he was sometimes at School of Prophets, um, having a laugh, having a good time, speaking openly. Um, look forward to spending some time around the campfires of the kingdom with Uncle John. <laughs> Apart from Uncle Purse, who was the greatest influence in your spiritual life? Oh, I assume Uncle Purse was Uncle Purse the exception by, again. By a mile, but then yeah. you, of course you see, I have to say this to you, it's a good question because anybody listening to what we're saying, it's a lesson for young fellas. Because you see, I had I was brought with a golden spoon in my mouth that, <laughs> because Uncle Purse was my mentor. That one day. So that was years of experience with him. But I must say that my life was probably in one way more influenced than ever in one week in nineteen fifty eight with the with the visit of Brother John Carter. Right. And I'll tell you how it happened. It wasn't so much knowledge as, as such, it was method. And he taught, he taught me a method which sent me through the roof and I'd do nothing now but use his method. Mm. And that, see, Perth was a master of historical records, chronicles, kings, the wanderings of the children of Israel, all that sort of thing. But when you get into the epistles and you get into the exposition of the word, uh, where the apostles, especially Paul, lays emphasis upon context and you know where, where a thing is found. Yeah. John Carter, he gave this, he, he came over to, to achieve unity in 58, and I was then, Enfield had started, I was on the AB, I was 27, and I sat with, with the, the committees, even at that age, when the unity talks were here. But to hear that man talk, and to see how he handled the Bible was entirely different. He wasn't a dramatic speaker like Uncle Purse, he was an older man, spoke deliberately, quietly, Yorkshire accent. But the way he used that Bible was just like, oh, it's like the sun came out. It, 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 it set me on fire because the way that he did that, and I'll never forget the first time I can tell you the very first instance that happened was when he, 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 was, he was dealing with Acts. He had a special group of talk on the Acts. And, uh, he, uh, and I thought to myself, well, the Acts of the Apostles, you know, and it got to Acts 7. Stephen's speech, and I love Stephen's speech, I'm like, well, I can't work this out because he's talking about the history of Israel. Who doesn't know that? He's talking about Jews and, who were born and bred. They had grand, grand, great grandparents, you know, way back knew that story standing on their head. What's it all about? And so Brother Carter made the point in Acts 6. He said, we can't understand, he said, Stephen's speech unless we understand the accusations made against him. And they were that he speaks blasphemous words against the law in this only place. <laughs> and he says, and this is how he opened Acts 7. So he said, once we understand that, we'll unravel this chapter. He said, what's this all going on about, see? And this is how he started. He reads Acts chapter 7. Men and brethren, hearken, he said, the God of glory. And he stopped. And he said, and when he said the God of glory, every eye, oh, every Jewish mind went straight between the cherubim, didn't they? Well, he appeared unto our father Abraham in Babylon. <laughs> Boom! The chapter flew over like that. I could have given the rest of the yeah. talk for him. It's amazing. It's, and it's amazing you're quoting Brother Carter because yesterday when I'm driving across, you again quoted Brother Carter in John when he said it's and you had a very poor uh, Yorkshire accent then too in your in your commentary but you talk about the way he used the word it was night yeah, it was just and it was night, night. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so exactly obviously he said it and it was night yeah <laughs> obviously a big influence on but him. that was the only thing then he showed me how that you've got to pick up a word a sentence mm. which is not a quotation always but sometimes an allusion and then when you go back there and you pick up the contextual argument, then you, you, it is no longer your opinion. You, there's nobody can say it's wrong. It, it, it's indelibly imprinted on your mind. And I have found, Charlie, over the years, in, in my speaking work, over the many, many years now, 
I have found by using that method, I've got brothers and sisters coming up to me, older brothers and sisters, who you wouldn't say were brilliant intellects. Yeah. Some very simple-minded but wonderful people. Mm. Salt of the earth will come up to me and remember those points when yeah. others have forgotten yeah. that you might be your opinion. Yeah. But yeah. when you put your finger on the nerve of the Bible, they'll never forget it. And yeah. that's what he taught me. Yeah. And that you asked Jim Luke, Brian Luke, Peter Weller, Des so all those boys I taught in Sunday school, you asked them about yeah. the effect that that had upon me and them. Yeah. But after Brother Carter hearing him for one week in that day, would just set me, I'll never set it, it just never ever left me. It was and that one week from that brother just was, I was so blessed to have that, that, that cup of really, Thanks. really was. Well, earliest memory of Uncle John would have to be Glenlock as a young kid, uh, five or six years old, and that was when mum wouldn't let you go to the study because you were too little, so you'd have to stay back at camp. She'd put you in your sleeping bag and turn the radio on, and they used to broadcast it over the radio, and then, you, you, so you'd hear Uncle John screaming from the platform and through the microphone and then you'd have this four second delay and then it would come again straight through the radio and uh, you weren't sleeping a wink. Uh, that's my very earliest memory of Uncle John, who sadly he's passed away. Uh, but I guess what a life that he had and, and such a big impact on so many people. We're very thankful that God worked in his life um, in the way that he did. and. I didn't have a huge amount to do with Uncle John personally. Um, I think I spoke to him probably once or twice. Um, but he was always there in our youth group studies uh, at study weekends. Um, of course, he did a lot of Hebrons for us, end of year studies. And the big one was Glenlock. Um, I think Glenlock was really Uncle John defined Glenlock in so many ways. And he brought characters to life and I think probably we'll all agree I'm not sure what anyone else is going to say about Uncle John but we'll all agree the three great things that um, he was blessed with was a, an amazing imagination he was blessed also with a, a great ability to verbalize that Im imagination too he could actually tell you what you what he was thinking and what he w was dreaming up in his head um, and I think you combine that finally with a, a really wonderful uh, insight into the scripture and he would just link all those things. He would teach you about things like Bible echoes and all that sort of stuff. And he just did, uh, so often he did an amazing job um, at sort of delivering the word of God and God really worked in his life, which is which was brilliant for us. We're very thankful for it. I think a lot of us, uh, a lot of young people that grew up with him too. Two takeaways. Number one, uh, he certainly taught me, and I, I, I'm very thankful for it, the use of the concordance. Uh, he was a big advocate for it, and he taught us, and we sat in many sessions, he would teach us how to use that really incredible tool to open up the Bible and, and to discover these Bible echoes and threads and, and just bring that whole, all these separate books into one amazing big story. So he was great at that. And of course, his example of dedication to the truth. He he poured his life into it, and even he'd tell you he didn't always get it right, and he would be the last one to say he did. Uh, but he lived his whole life, uh, and, and he's really served so many people over so many generations, and we're all uh, eternally thankful for it. And we can't wait to see him in that kingdom, which I'm sure is going to be a, a great day to see him there, and uh, we pray it very soon. Okay, so that was an easy answer to a, to a relatively easy question. Here's another relatively easy question for you. Are you a romantic? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, what was the last romantic thing you did for Auntie Vernon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just took a recently on a, on a uh, oh, yeah. houseboat trip. <laughs> Two quick memories about Uncle John. Firstly, the June weekend would have been about 1984. I would have been 20. And Uncle John was staying with us, with Mum and I. And I was driving him to the meeting on Sunday morning. And when you drove along Canterbury Road and then you crossed Springvale Road, 
On the right-hand side now, there is a, a large fruit and vegetable shop called Strawberry Point, I think it's called. And But back then, it was a massive car dealership run by a guy called John Martin. And he used to have this, this enormous sign out the front of the dealership, would have been about 20 metres wide, and the lettering was 10 or 15 feet high, and the sign just simply said, Trust John Martin. <laughs> I remember when Uncle John saw that sign, he, he would have been, must have been early 50s at the time, and I've never seen a man of that age so excited. <laughs> he was like a little boy, just about leapt across my lap in the driver's seat and out the window. If only we had mobile phones with cameras back then, what a shot that would have been. My other memory is, it would have been about 15 years ago, and I was sitting in my car in Flinders Lane in the city, right next to the city square, stopped at the traffic lights, and my driver's side window was right down, and I was listening to Uncle John on a tape, very loud, very dramatic, and I'm sitting there, and I looked out my front window, and I could see Bert Newton there. <laughs> he was... He was approaching my car, and as he came up to the window, Bert actually heard John Martin speaking, and he paused because I think he was impressed by the very um, dramatic nature of what he was hearing, and he paused and looked in and looked at me, and then he kept on his way. So uh, Bert knows what it's all about. Hello. I've been asked to speak a little bit about John Martin and my recollections of him. Um, so mainly as a young person, my, the June weekends were synonymous with John Martin. Um, in my three years dating Steve, I would travel from Sydney to Melbourne regularly. And at the June weekend, we would catch up with friends, many having traveled from interstate to hear Brother John. So most June weekends, John would come to Stan and Alice's place for a long lunch at some time during the weekend. And there I met him off stage, so to speak. He was a bit intimidating but um, his passion and larger than life persona was something that I remember well. He had an infectious laugh and was up for a good story. Clearly he was a passionate brother who loved the Bible and had a gift of delivery. I remember his recall of scripture, often reciting verbatim huge sections of the Bible on any subject. His memory really was absolutely outstanding. In my early years with Steve, a group of us wanted to start a youth group at Blackburnham. And I can recall Steve, who was probably around 19 at the time, plucking up the courage at the end of one June weekend to go to John and request that if he was willing to do next year's June weekend on the subject of the atonement, then the young people would commit to devoting a year to studying it in preparation of that weekend. I remember how John was very excited to hear a young man ask for this and immediately he said he'd do it. When Steve responded that it would need to go through the ABs first, John said something like, don't you worry, if they have a problem with it, tell them to call me. And with that, he laughed and left. I was so happy to hear some months later that John stood by his commitment and came back a year later to give a memorable series on this powerful subject. And during that year, the Blackburn Youth Group commenced home studies every two weeks on that subject, covering a study of the book, The Blood of Christ, Robert Roberts, The Slain Lamb, also by Brother Robert Roberts, and Redemption in Christ Jesus by Brother Barling. By the time the June weekend came, our youth group was well prepared, very excited, and really enjoyed the studies by Brother John. I well remember those uh, studies that uh, Jen is talking about. I think it was 1983. And I was the uh, Sunday school superintendent and, and because it was our closing study, I was the chairman and we, we got all the, all the little kiddies up from the Sunday school to sing an item for Uncle John. And, and while the, the kiddies were up there, uh, Uncle John had put all of his overhead transparency notes that he was going to use for his study that, 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 that morning uh, in, in, in the lectern area. And uh, one of the kids bumped the, bumped the, <laughs> bumped the table and, and a glass of water got knocked over. And, and Uncle John took uh, great pleasure in uh, in throwing me under the bus in in relation to that uh, that watering down of, uh, of of his notes and his overheads, and it went something like this. Good morning, my beloved brethren and sisters. As you can see, Charlie has you know our dear friend Charlie here has succeeded in uh, tipping a glass of water over my transparencies, which are my notes for this morning. And I would infer from that that because on a very difficult and a fundamental subject that he's obviously trying to water down the truth. 
Well done, Charlie. <laughs> These are my notes. Tell me you're not right, not wrong. Tis June too in a minute. <laughs> well, brothers and sisters, there's our trials in life, I suppose. We must endure for the sake of the truth. One of them's Charlie. <laughs> But anyway, what we thought we'd do this morning, I'm in a relaxed frame of mind, as you can see. I haven't got any notes except those transparencies, and we are going to all of the, the program somewhat, in that I felt that uh, with all the questions that have been coming, and it's not an easy subject, that what we would do is go over these transparencies and try and summarise in our mind the principles of atonement. Um, I love Uncle John's studies at Glenlock and Hebron. Um, he really brought the Bible to life and... Bible characters as well. Um, I loved his passion and his enthusiasm for Christ and the kingdom to come. Always uh, love remembering Uncle John once he was doing his talks and you'd see when his passion would take over and you'd see his eyes close and you'd see his mind ticking over but most of all you'd feel the passion that he had and I guess living by that example and, and having the exposition we have we truly are blessed and now all I can think of when I heard the news is the passion that we'll see again when Christ, Christ returns and you can see the excitement all over his face and hear his voice. I look forward to that day. My most two vivid memories of Uncle John Martin are, number one, I remember listening to uh, one of his talks to you on Samson and one of the things he said had a really powerful impact on me. He was talking about Samson getting involved with Delilah and telling her about his vow. And he said since Samson was a Nazarite, at the conclusion of his vow, his hair was supposed to be placed on the altar and offered as a sacrifice to God, showing where his love and dedication went. But instead, it ended up in the lap of a harlot. And what a sad and tragic ending for, for that young man to give his life to that woman. When he had so much potential, he could have done so many amazing things with God, but he chose that instead. And what did she do in, in return? She shaved his hair off and sold him out to the Philistines for money. And that's exactly what happens when we give our time and attention to anything other than God. And number two, on a much less serious note, but for some reason it's always just stuck with me, during a talk on the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus using the, the five loaves and the two fish to feed the crowd, Uncle John addressed the audience and he said, banging on the rostrum, and how applicable is this to all of us, brothers and fishes? And it must have been, must have been Adelaide because nobody even laughed. They just <laughs> all kept nodding along. What's your favourite meal, John? Well, uh, my favourite meal, well, I'll tell you what my favourite meal is. Is when Aunty Verna, um, she, I, I love sausages and mash. I'm, I'm a very simple eater, Charlie. As yep. a matter of fact, I've got a brother in the truth who you who go unnamed, it's a bit of an aristocrat when it comes to food. He says, I'm the most, uh, what did he call it, Werner? Boring. The most boring eater in the, in the British Empire. Okay, so I, speaking of simple foods, uh, legend has it, a uh, myth has it, that you love mushrooms. Yeah, I do. And that you have been known on your trips across the Victorian plains yes. to stop the car, Definitely. grab the mushrooms, exactly. take them to my mum, yes. and you're right. And, and, and cooked them up, and that Absol was something yeah, Pauline we would, we Matter of fact, we pulled up at a service station at Backers Marsh. <laughs> Remember that? And we pulled up this service station to fill up, and just past there, there was a bit of a green sward there by the side. And you were just, what was it? Later with mushrooms. We turned up at your mum's place no. with a whole bag. <laughs> My memories of Uncle John are the times um, that he spent at the School of the Prophets that I attended and he was there. And he left a great impression upon me of by making the Bible live, particularly the characters within the Bible, people like Abraham and Joseph and Samson and Elijah and John the Baptist and our Lord Jesus Christ. He just really made the Bible exciting and he really made it live. Another thing he really impressed upon me was he showed how he put so much work into understanding what the Bible was telling and he really got down to the essence of scriptural passages which was really helpful to be shown clearly this is what God is saying I found that quite powerful 
And so I'm grateful. Um, and that's the impact that he has had on myself. Um, one particular story I remember as well was that um, we were having a sort of a night where we were talking about uh, how Uncle John sort of came to the truth and how that story sort of evolved. And I was sitting in the front row while he was telling that story. And it was quite an animated, he was getting very animated while he was telling that story. And it was the story of how um, he was younger and playing football. And he was sort of lined up in the centre of the ground and the football coaches were walking up and down the line sort of shouting in, um, at these players about how they needed to make football their life, how they needed to dedicate everything to football. And there was a particular poignant moment where his coach came up to him and grabbed him by his shirt and said, football will be your religion. And because I was um, in the front row, as he was acting out this scenario, he grabbed me on the front there on by my shirt and sort of said, and football would be a religion. And it was a very um, intense moment and he was really getting into it and everyone was really getting into the story. And the sad thing was, was that while he was doing that and when he grabbed my top like that, he actually grabbed a fistful of my chest hair and was pulling it out, which was ex exceedingly painful at the time. But because it was such um, a supercharged story and that was the crescendo of his story, I had to stifle a little scream because it was so painful. But yes, that's one of the things that I remember about Uncle John. Yeah, and he'll, um, he'll definitely be greatly missed. Well, my fondest memories of Uncle John would be when he used to come down and speak at Melbourne School of Prophets in the early 2000s. I think he came down for at least three weeks and he'd spend a whole week with about 30 to 40 young guys from Melbourne. Um, a lot of them would have been from Blackburn and I'm sure could remember those weeks fondly. And I think for me, the most memorable things about what I took away from those weeks was how much one Uncle John absolutely loved the Bible um, as his number one thing in life. And the other thing was how real he made that Bible feel. It wasn't just like a regular normal book. It was a living, breathing book that had come from God and it was interconnected um, in, this, in this most unbelievable way. And I remember he did a whole week once at those School of Prophets on the subject of the sacrifices under the law of Moses. And you couldn't have thought of a more boring subject that you could speak to a, a group of young guys about. But he, he made that subject absolutely live. And I remember by the end of the week, all of the guys just absolutely loving it because he can, he showed how these principles of these sacrifices were so relevant and so practical to your everyday life. And then he connected them and showed how they had their outworking and their fulfillment in the life of Jesus and his sacrifice. And he made the whole book so real. And I certainly remember those, those times very fondly. He'd also talk really honestly about ecclesial life and about his personal life and struggles that he had himself, which made life and the truth and principles that you were trying to apply to your own life very real. And I certainly remember those those times very, very fondly. I remember one funny occasion, Uncle John used to love one of his favourite things was after his studies, he'd go around with his Bible and he would tell all these young young guys about all these connections that were in the Bible, unbelievable connections. And he would say, you know, see the amazing point, boys, that, you know, here. And I remember one time Sam Taylor, who was a good friend of mine, he said to me one day, he said, I'm going to go up to Uncle John and I'm going to just pick two random passages from the Bible, one from the Old Testament, one from the New Testament. They've got no connection between each other. And I'm going to go up to him and I'm going to say, you know, explain to him and say, see the amazing point, Uncle John, between those two verses. So he went up and he he showed him the his two verses. He said, do you see the point, Uncle John? And Uncle John went, Sam, that is beautiful. Oh, that is awesome. I can see what you've done and what's happening in Zechariah and how it applies in the New Testament. Oh, it's beautiful. And he made this amazing point out of these two random passages of the Bible. But that's what he loved doing more than anything, was he loved just talking about the principles and the power of that book. And that's something that I, I've, I, that I remember of him and that I very, very fondly have taken in, into the rest of my life. 
Something of the kingdom. Do you have a special vision yes, or picture? Do. Yes, I do. A very Can you be succinct with that? I've got a dozen of them, but, yeah. but this, this was my greatest vision of the kingdom. I'm longing for the day to see Zechariah chapter 8 fulfilled when they'll take hold of the skirt of him as a Jew. Charlie, I reckon that is a stroke of genius. You, 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 think, you think of that, a stroke of genius. That, that if, you wanted, if you wanted it with the stroke of a pen, humble the whole world, how would you do it? How would you, what would you do to humble the whole world? What, what would you possibly do that, that would strike every heart, every mind, every soul and flatten them to the earth? Than to say to them, you want to see this new king? He's Jesus Christ. You know he's the son. Yes, we realise you he's the son of God. We want to see him. You know, that's our life's ambition. Can we see the king? Yes, you can. How do we get there? By taking hold of a skirt of him that is a Jew. I want to see that done. I want to see people's mouths fall open. And to say, we've got to go to that despicable, low, filthy, money-grabbing mob, the murderers of the Son of God, to take hold of their clothing, to be taken to the Lord? Mm. Yes, you've got to do that. I want to see that. But Charlie, before that, before that, I want to see themselves humbled. Now you think about this. Here's a vision for you. In Zechariah, what does he say is going to happen? Who are they? They say, who are you? Who are these? Who's mine? He'll show them the wounds in his hands, won't he? Now, what does Zechariah say? Every tribe goes apart. Ah, that's only one separation. Every major family's got to go apart. So there's another separation. And wait a minute, we haven't got to the list yet. Then we go to his man, his wife, and his family. But now here's the man, the wife, and their family apart. And then finally, finally, husband and wife have got to go apart. So they go alone into a room and lock the door and they're not at the wailing wall, nodding with their heads against while tourists take their pictures to see all the wonderful humility of the Jews, which is absolutely just a, a, a sham. No, they're in a room where nobody can see them and they break their heart. I want to see that done first. I want to see that done and then I want to see them come out at new people, genuinely repentant, and I want to see the world go up and say, please, so you, you, can you take me to your Lord? I want to see that. I want to see that done. I reckon that is a stroke of genius that God has done mm. by, by setting up the whole scenario of that to flatten everyone's pride to the yeah. ground. Flatten them up. I reckon that's just marvellous. That's a vision of my king. And then, of course, won't take any more time. The other thing is, to, to, if, if I was to choose a job in the kingdom, I, I want to be there. But if I had a choice, I'd become a Minister of Agriculture. I want to see the desert blossom as the rose. I want to yeah. see water to bring life to the things. Yeah. I want to see that. Yeah. I've got a hundred other visions. Yeah. But no, no. Let, let no. Put them yeah. Just a couple of other things. Um, in, in relation to the way the truth is today and the ecclesial world is today, where do you think we sit? I'm more interested. I'm worried sick. I really am. I, I, I suppose it, it's a question of, you know, the oldies versus the youngies and all that sort of thing. And there's a lot of bias and people, you know, say things and, and they think you're biased because of your age and things. But I, 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 I don't think that's influencing my thinking. But in my 60 odd years in the truth now, I, How old I see you now, the truth. How old are you now? 83. You're 83, right. Okay. Yeah, and I see, uh, I see enormous problems, enormous problems. And I don't think our brotherhood is, is aware of, the, of what's going to happen. I think that there's going to be a I, I think there's a comfortable feeling around it. Oh, we're going to be taken out of it. Well, we are. But I think they've forgotten that Jesus said in the same day that the flood came, no, you know, that no built the ark, the flood came. In the same day, that lot came out of Sodom and got blown out of the ground. I think we're going to see awful things. And Charlie, I want, this is a good question and I'm glad it's going on record because I, I really feel that this is a message I want to leave at my graveside. That what is happening is that we are a people who curse humanism but are visibly affected by it and we can't see it. And you see, in the scripture, 
you know, the, 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 the two great commandments, the love your Lord your God with all your heart and your neighbour as yourself. And we're going to try and balance that because God is all justice and mercy and so forth. But Charlie, this is what's happening. Humanism is affecting us. What is humanism? What, would you, what is the, the condensation of his humanism is this? There's no other sin that you can, there's only one sin that you can commit, and that's to hurt somebody. People can be homosexuals, lesbians, pigs that can be what they like, but you mustn't hurt them. That's the only sin you can commit, and that spirit is coming into the brotherhood. And we're hearing a lot about mercy and justice and compassion and understanding, and, and, and I agree with all of that. They're wonderful principles. But first and foremost, it's the righteousness of God has been forgotten. And when people think about this, and this is I see is the critical factor, and I, I want to leave this, I'm glad you're doing this, indelibly for people's minds, I want to leave this message, Charlie, that what's going to happen is going to be tragic if we don't quickly wait, and that is this, we say, why did Jesus die? There is all sorts of, he had to die for himself, and of course he, he had to die, of course he, it was an act of obedience, wasn't it? Not because they have a tone of a nature, which is a nonsense, but it was an act of obedience because he had our nature and he had to demonstrate God's righteousness. But first and foremost, he died for his father, Charlie, didn't he? Yeah. He died to tell the world, we're mortal because my father made us mortal and he was right. God was right about that. So Jesus died to teach the world in agony that my father is right in demanding the death of this nature because it's no good. Yeah. You can't perpetuate that. And then his father was right to raise him from the dead because he said that. But if he didn't say that first, he'd have never been raised from the dead. And that's where our imbalance is. Now, we want to go beyond that declaration. We want to come over here and get all God's benefits without saying that. Yeah. That's what's happening. And in every aspect of life, and, and you, you get this, this, what's going on now, you get this theistic evolution. I make no apology for mentioning this, but I don't care who in the heck hears it. And you get there's all this sort of thing of what's going to happen and the theories that are going around and you get the idea that, well, as long as they don't speak about it, that is wrong. Yeah. It's not a question of not speaking about it. It's, it is a wrong doctrine. It is an insult to the Creator. It's virtually telling us they didn't tell us the truth. Yeah. Yeah. And unless that's acknowledged, yeah. that thing will never be cured. But yeah. watch what will happen. Yeah. Yeah. You watch what will happen and I'll predict what will happen. There'll be some ecclesiastes who'll make a right decision, and there are some ecclesiastes will say, "Well, we don't believe it. We don't believe that nonsense about this create this evolution thing." But it's not an issue of fellowship. That's what's yeah. going to happen. Why? Because of humanism. Yeah. But they don't know that. Yeah. You understand what I mean? Absolutely. I do. Now, I'm yeah. glad that's on video. Yeah. I'm not up yeah. who's the yeah. Caesar. Life today. When issues come up. God is forgotten and we've got to be compassionate and loving and kind. Sure we do. I'm yeah. not against that yeah. at all. Yeah. Once the, the righteousness of God is acknowledged, Charlie, mercy is... There's no limitations yeah. to the mercy you can show and yeah. the love you can show. Yeah. But until that's done... Yeah. Well, spot on. Absolutely. And that's what's wrong today. Yeah. And humanism's done that. It's, yeah. It has subconsciously affected the thinking of our brotherhood. It's just an incredible situation. Jump. It's been a real pleasure to yeah, catch up with you. Oh, I know the brothers and sisters back in uh, Melbourne and in Blackburn will be looking forward yeah. to, to seeing you uh, through this. And, and, and thanks for yeah. your time, really appreciate oh, it. Thanks for coming, Charlie. Oh, you're, you're very, very welcome. You'd be welcome even without your camera. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're larger than a leg. <laughs> you know, it's funny.